Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Ingrid Manson, and I'm happy to be with you today for this series for Cambridge Muslim College. I am coming to you from my home in London, Ontario, Canada, where I am the London and Windsor Community Chair in Islamic Studies at Huron University College. And I am also the um, founder and director of the Harma Project, which is a research project dedicating, dedicated to upholding the sacred inviolability of every person who enters Muslim spaces. And you can look for our research on our website, hormaproject.com. I'm really honored uh, to be teaching once again with CMC, especially in this blessed month of Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. Of course, I know that many of us wish we could just keep hearing from Sheikh Abdul Hakim on this platform. And certainly he could have been one of those scholars who would build a school or institute around himself. There are few scholars in our time, certainly few teaching in English whose knowledge, insight and eloquence of expression come close to him. May Allah protect him and strengthen him. But it is evidence of his sincerity that he did not do that. He did not create a cult or a commune. He has not, not asked people to abandon their parents and homelands to submit to his authority. Rather, he has dedicated himself to teaching, to be a link in the chain of continuing scholarship through the establishment of a college where other scholars of diverse disciplines, backgrounds, and perspectives can share their wisdom, knowledge, experience, and insights. CMC has always provided equal education for men and women and has been a place where women scholars and teachers sit on the same dignified platform as men. It has been one of the great blessings of my life to have known Sheikh Abdul Hakim and his wonderful family for over two decades and to learn from him now often through lectures like this one that CMC shares on various digital platforms. Truth be told, Sheikh Abdul Hakim and I do not agree on, on everything. We do not share all of our perspectives, but that's just the point, isn't it? We don't have to agree about everything to respect each other and support each other, to learn from each other and love each other for the sake of Allah. Indeed, it is impossible to grow intellectually, spiritually, and socially if we do not acknowledge that each one of us only has a sliver of insight and a tiny share of knowledge among all the knowledge and insight that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reflected to humanity. Although some, like Sheikh Abdul Hakim, have been blessed with two or three shares at least. It is a tragedy of our age that many self-styled sheikhs, speakers, and preachers are untouchable because they have sheltered themselves in remote or insular communes. But these days, more often because they operate on an unregulated social media platform, sometimes with business models that reward outrageous attacks on other Muslims. That is, they are deliberately controversial while veiling themselves with the rhetoric of free speech or skepticism because controversy generates clicks and clicks generate dollars. Cambridge Muslim College, may Allah preserve it and help it grow, has done something brilliant thanks to, she thanks to Sheikh Abdul Hakim's wisdom and his ongoing active search for diverse professionals and scholars whom he has put in charge of developing and running public and educational program. This college, a not-for-profit entity, as should be the status of any Islamic Institute of Religious Learning, is in the heart of Cambridge, open and transparent to the public, while learning is also shared in beautiful and accessible ways with people across the world. I want to emphasize that staff at CMC did not ask me to say any of this, they only asked if I was able to say a word about planting a seed and giving to CMC, but I wanted to say more at the beginning of this series 
because I feel very strongly that today students face a minefield when they venture out on the path of knowledge. Students are so vulnerable and they face abuse and exploitation, exploitation, racism, misogyny, disempowerment, or they're made irrelevant to the broader community or their social conscience is enervated by what my former colleague at Hartford Seminary, Professor Yahya Michaud called spiritual diabetes. CMC is a rare gem in the wild, wild west and in the world. I encourage you to donate to support its ongoing programming and its growth. Yalla, bismillah. Let's turn to our lecture topic. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli wa sahibi ajma'in. Ummul Mu'mineen, Aisha bint Abi Bakr, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab. May Allah be pleased with them are two of the towering companions of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They shared many characteristics, including great intelligence, frankness of speech, boldness in action, and a passion for justice. Their intimate relationships with the Prophet made them embodiments of the Sunnah in ways that sometimes challenged others, especially those seeking to reinforce status hierarchies and privileges as the Ummah expanded. As confident leaders, Aisha and Omar were also not afraid to admit their mistakes. And they demonstrated that transparency and vigilance are critical for personal and communal growth. When I was asked by CMC what subject I would like to address for this series, Sowing a Seed, I knew that I wanted to focus on a topic broadly in the area of Islamic ethics, as that is the primary focus of my scholarship. In particular, I'm interested in situational, or we could even say relational ethics. That is, how do we realize in our actions, in our communities, in our institutions, the principles and values of our faith? In our lives, in this dunya, which is our testing ground, it is not an easy task because it's not good enough to have a good intention or to cultivate virtues or to be intelligent, although all of those are important. And it's not enough to have memorized qawa'id and fawa'id and maqasid, although those provide helpful frameworks and heuristics. We have to seek nasiha, but are we turning only to those who share our views in doing so? We have to engage in shura, but for how long and by what means? And what if we aren't even aware of those who should be consulted or included in decision-making? We have to collaborate to promote what is good and to deter what is wrong. But we are also taught that it is better to avoid a harm than to promote a benefit if we can only do one or the other. So when do we act and when do we hold back? When do we speak out and when do we demur? Well, you get the point. It is complicated to put our values and principles into action. And we often have to live in a state of ambivalence and uncertainty. To be a confident Muslim, therefore, does not mean that we always know what we're doing is the right thing or is the best thing. To be confident means that we are comfortable living in a state of uncertainty with the knowledge that all our Creator asks of us is that we keep striving to purify our intentions, to keep learning, to repent of our wrongdoings, and to repair our relationships. There are many paths to learning ethics and to being formed into an ethical person, or at least to become a person who's first instincts are usually ethical. And one of the means, while it is not sufficient, it can be very effective, is by hearing the life stories of others. Even asking one's own parents and grandparents or elders in the community can yield nuggets of wisdom and can help us be more patient and more courageous. 
These stories can take us out of our constant panic about present risks and difficulties and help us understand that we as individuals are not at the center of history, we're only part of it. Certainly our roles are not unimportant because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created each one of us, each one of us, and has ensouled each one of us and has destined each one of us to live our own individual particular lives. Laqad karamna bani Adam. Allah has dignified us. But wisdom and knowledge and insight are his and the end is his. Over the years, as I've struggled with various ethical issues and I've tried to structure my service to the Muslim community in an ethical manner, making many mistakes along the way, I have often returned again and again to the life stories and examples of women mu'mineen Aisha and Amir al-Mu'mineen Omar. And that is why I will be focusing on these two great companions for the next few weeks. Now, I will not be narrating complete biographies of these two towering figures. Perhaps that will be done by Sheikh Abdul Hakim in his wonderful series, Paradigms of Islamic Leadership. Rather, I'm exploring this theme of seeding and nurturing, cultivating and harvesting through their life stories. So let's begin with, uh, not the beginning, but say the middle. And I want to look at something that happened in the year 15 of the Hijra. So this is two years after Sayyidina Omar was appointed leader of the Muslims by Abu Bakr when he knew he was dying. It is a number of years after the death of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is a time when the Muslim community has uh, rapidly expanded, many, many people coming into Islam and many lands coming under the jurisdiction of the uh, Caliph. And things need to be done differently. You know, we so often want to uh, just think about how things were in the old days and, and keep them as they were, but changing times cause uh, call for changing reactions. So for example, in the Jahili period among the tribes, when there was warfare, um, there was no standing army. Uh, there were battles. And if any goods were confiscated in battle, then they were distributed among the fighting people. During the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, again, there is no standing army. Uh, every able-bodied Muslim was required to contribute to the extent that they were able. And, and someone who was not able-bodied also would try to contribute to the extent that they were able. Fear Allah as as far as you were able to do so. And that meant that there was no payment, there was no salary to fighters. They lived their lives, they um, you know, did their jobs, and then they were, uh, if they engaged in battle, and there were some goods that were confiscated, they were distributed among uh, uh, those who had engaged in that effort. But things were very different by the time uh, Sayyidina Omar became Amir al-Mu'mineen, commander of the believers, because the kinds of property that now came uh, um, into the control of the state included things like agricultural lands. Well, you can't divide up ag agricultural lands to people who are not farmers, who are not agriculturalists. And so, uh, a different system had to be uh, undertaken. And this really is uh, the brilliance, uh, the genius of Sayyidina Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, is that we see him constantly 
analyzing and evaluating the current situation and understanding that um, to follow the Sunnah uh, of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not necessarily to do everything in the same way, especially in Muhammadat, but it was to in fact bring the principles and the prophetic light and example as far as he was able into the constantly changing and present situation. So this is why um, Sayyidina Umar decided to establish a diwan. And the diwan was, uh, was two things. It was both a registry of those who were um, uh, engaged in fighting um, to defend the, the uh, Muslim community. And it was a registry of pensions to those who had served the Muslim community in the past um, or who were part of the Muslim community or affiliated with the Muslim community. So it's, it's a military registry and payments it is a registry of pensions, and it is a kind of um, registry of, of welfare of those who would um, just be supported. Uh, it's not zakat. Zakat is something different. Zakat is uh, taken from the community, from the, the excess wealth that people have, and redistributed to certain categories, in particular to close the gap between rich and poor. But this is um, the, the state recognizing the service uh, of those who have contributed to the, um, uh, to the development and growth and establishment, first and foremost, of the Muslim community, of the Muslim Ummah, and those who continue to serve in all of their various ways. Now, how was this to be done? Sayyidina Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, decided that he would look at seniority in Islam. Those who came uh, and served and came into Islam and served uh, the Muslim Ummah and served Islam from the earliest days, that they would be, would get precedence. Um, in those days, in those first days, as we know, that when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was just beginning to, to preach Islam, that there was no glimmer that embracing this faith, that responding to the call would in any way yield material rewards. Um, in fact, it was the opposite. What was uh, the result of embracing Islam was marginalization, stigmatization, if someone didn't have the protection of their tribe or of a strong, you know, at least one strong person in the tribe, then they could be beaten, they could be tortured, they could even be killed. Okay. So we go, before we go on to the um, next part, uh, what I'd like you to do, because I'm, um, if we were in a classroom, I'd be using a whiteboard or a blackboard. You can get out a pencil and a paper because I'm going to give you a few figures, a few numbers. So if you would like to jot them down while I read them out, that will let you uh, participate. So I'll just give you a minute to get a pencil and a paper. All right. So, um, so when Sayyidina Umar um, consulted with the companions and after consultation decided to establish the Diwan, Sayyidina Ali and, and uh, Abdurrahman uh, Ibn Auf, may Allah be pleased with them, said to Ahmed, well, begin with yourself. Put yourself at the top of the, of the list because you are Amir al-Mu'mineen. And Sayyidina Ahmed said, no, I'll begin with the uncle of the Messenger of, of God 
and then go to the next person and the next person. So here we see right up front that Sayyidina Almir does not see himself as the, the most important or the most significant uh, or the person who's at the top of the Muslim Ummah. He is in his role uh, and certainly takes his authority seriously. But he has a system here, and the system is seniority in Islam. So he says, I will begin with the messenger of Allah. And by that, he means Al-Abbas. May Allah be pleased with him. So Al-Abbas is, is given 12,000 dirhams. Some reports say 25,000 dirhams. Um, there's a difference of opinion. But um, let's go with the, the lower number. It may be that. So 12,000 dirhams. Now, the next category are those who fought at Badr. Those who fought at Badr are given a pension of 5,000 dirhams. And their wives are given a pension of 500 dirhams. Those who entered Islam after Badr and before Hudaybiya are given a pension of 4,000 and their wives 400. Those who entered Islam after Hudaybiyah um, until the end of the of the Rida Wars, and that's um, which happened during the Caliphate of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, they have a pension of 3,000 and their wives 300. Those who fought in Qadisiya and in Syria after that are given 2,000 and their wives 200. And those who demonstrated in those difficult battles uh, exemplary or outstanding bravery have an added bonus of 500. So they get 2,500 instead of 2,000. Those who embraced Islam after Qadisiya and Yarmouk, 1,000. A later group, 500 a group that comes even later than that, 300. And it did not matter if they were Arab or non-Arab, strong or weak, they're just the people who entered Islam. Uh, the next group are given 250. And then the next group, which include um, the Christians of al Hira, are paid 200. And all other Muslim women and children, those who are under the jurisdiction of uh, the, uh, the Muslim Ummah or who are part of the Muslim Ummah are under the jurisdiction of the state are given a uh, payment of 100. Now, after that, there were some special classes of people. So uh, Sayyidina Abu Dhar, and Sanman al-Farsi are given, are put in the same class as those who fought at Badr. Because of their extraordinary importance to Islam and closeness to the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Al-Hasan and al Hussein are put in the same category as those who fought at Badr. And that is a recognition by Sayyidina Umar of the special um, uh, uh, of the special closeness of, of those who are in the family of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ahlul that uh, it is that closeness to the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that um, makes them also to have this unique and special status in the Muslim Ummah. And then there are Umm al Hatim Mu'minin. Now, before I tell you, I want you to think about how much do you think uh, the Umm al Hatim Mu'mineen are paid? What pension are they given? You can talk about it among yourselves and think about it. Well, I'll tell you. Sayyidina Omar gave a pension of 10,000 dirhams to Umm al Hatim Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers. So this is twice the payment that is given to those who fought at Badr, twice the payment of Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein and Abu Dhar and Salman al-Farsi, 
and you'll all be pleased with them. It is the highest payment except for uh, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad Sassam and Abbas. Now, interestingly, initially, Sayyidina Umar, he uh, tried to distinguish between those who had been free women and those who had been uh, initially were captives of war. But all of the widows of the Prophet Muhammad Sassam, they objected and they said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not prefer us to them in the division of his time, make us all equal. And we see their, their beautiful principled stance in this way. And uh, in addition to that, Sayyidina Omar tried to give 2,000 more to Aisha because he said the Prophet loved her most. But she did not accept that. So Sayyidina Aisha, she said, no, make me equal with my sisters. And if she had accepted that amount, that extra 2,000, then she would have been equal with Al Abbas at, at the top of the Diwan if the 12,000 figure is the correct one rather than the 25,000 one. Now, after that, what Sayyidina Umar did, in addition to, to regulating and, and setting out these numbers, uh, these pension numbers um, in the Diwan, was uh, another genius move on his part, subhanAllah. He gathered 60 poor people and he gave them bread to eat. So he gathered them all in one place and he distributed the bread. And when they finished eating, they went and they counted how much had been eaten and then divided it by 60. And he found that, um, that if you divide that by 60, the average of what each person had eaten was more than two jaribas. This is a certain amount. So what Sayyidina Umar did was he allotted to each um, person, to them and then to their family, two jaribas for each month. Uh, and um, of course, some people eat more, some people eat less. So by taking this, um, this average, he was able to give an amount that, um, that seemed to be the right, you know, enough for most people. And Sayyidina Ahmed said before his death, I was planning to make payments of 4,000 dirhams each, like a, a, a one-time payment to each of the poor people in the Ummah. The man would um, give 1,000 to his family. So his wife would take 1,000. He would take 1,000 for himself. With, an, with another 1,000, he would use it to equip himself right? That means to be able to have enough um, for his own defense, for the defense of the, of the Ummah. And 1,000 he would equip his home. So his home would have what was sufficient to be able to live. So really this is a, a, a one-time significant welfare payment in order to bring the standard of those who were um, in, a, in uh, economically uh, lower than the rest to the uh, extent that they were categorized as poor that would bring them up to the level of sufficiency, them and their families. But Sayyidina Umar died before he could uh, implement that policy. You know, all of these things that Sayyidina Umar did were, were innovations, good innovations. Um, in the area of mu'amalat, in the area of the distribution of wealth, but all of it was following the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad SAW and the principles and guidelines in the Quran that are towards bringing the ummah together to try to close the gaps between rich and poor, to have compassion and reflect compassion, um, not only uh, you know, that it's not enough to give charity, but this, the uh, society needs to be structured according to fairness and justice, and also to recognize precedents in terms of taqwa, that 
those who have taqwa, this is the only kind of precedence, and also the special position of the family of the Prophet, Ahlul Bayt, which is um, set out and stated in the Quran. Now, let's go back to some take home points from this. One, we see that Sayyidina Umar, Umar ibn al Khattab min Mu'minin, he does not place himself at the top. He does not use his position as a leader as a way to justify um, enriching himself in, in any way. Far to the contrary, and we'll talk much more about that in later uh, lectures. Sayyidina Ahmed also recognizes that even though the men are the ones who are required um, to fight and that with whatever wealth they have, they're required to provide nafaka for their wives, meaning that the men have to use their wealth to um, provide the food, um, housing, clothing, you know, the basic needs for their wives he also recognized that the wives of the fighters made real contributions to the Ummah and they deserve a tangible recognition uh, for that. So they were given pensions as well. You know, a, a small pension compared to what their husbands had, but again, they were not required to provide maintenance to their husbands. Their husbands were required to provide maintenance to them as well as any payment in the, the mahar, the marriage gift that they, they would have made initially. And I think this is this is an important point and something that as we go through these lectures, I'm going to return to again. Sayyidina Ahmed and his relationship with women and his view uh, of women. Much contemporary literature, unfortunately, portrays Sayyidina Ahmed, excuse me for saying this, as a misogynist. Um, and I've reviewed a lot of recent literature and the same kind of tropes are made again and again about uh, Sayyidina Umar. And I, I find it very offensive um, and simply untrue and unbalanced. It is true that Sayyidina Umar, like others, like all of us, really struggled with the attitudes um, that he had absorbed being raised in a non-Islamic and un-Islamic and anti-Islamic culture before he came into Islam. He really did struggle with, you know, the attitudes about women that had formed him as a Jahili Meccan man before he came into Islam. Once, for example, when he was arguing with his wife and she started arguing back, he blamed the fact that his wife was more argumentative with him on the culture of the Ansar, whose women raised tough in an agricultural oasis were far more outspoken than the Qurayshi townswomen, you know, as a kind of, you know, the, the, the country woman compared to the townswoman. So yes, we do see Sayyidina Omar struggling with these inherited and ingrained attitudes, but we also see himself forcing himself to submit to the teachings of Islam and trying to follow the example of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I've seen, for example, many contemporary writers criticize Sayyidina Umar for being reluctant to let his wife go to the masjid and that he only allowed it because the Messenger of Allah said, the tamna'u ima Allah masajid Allah, do not forbid the women servants of God from the mosques, mosques of God. But the point is, isn't it, that he did force himself to submit, even though it was hard. Uh, we're told that Atika bint Zaid, for example, the wife of Umar ibn al-Khattab, used to ask his permission to go to the mosque. And Sayyidina Umar would not say anything. She'd ask him, is it OK if I go to the mosque? He wasn't saying anything. And she would declare, Wallahi, I will go out unless you forbid me. And he wouldn't forbid her. So he, he, it was, he, he couldn't get himself to the point of saying, yes, go ahead, but he didn't stop. And that was his struggle to really accept what the Prophet Muhammad Sam ordered. And don't we all have sometimes struggle with what we know we have to do, what 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants of us, what the Prophet Muhammad um, taught us. You know, we'll also talk about later in our lectures how, you know, not only did Sayyidina Umar struggle with this, he also struggled with this, with an ingrained impulse to physically strike out when he was angry or as a form of discipline. In his later life, Sayyidina Umar would recount that as a boy, he was constantly beaten. And, you know, this was a part of his formation. We'll see that the Prophet Muhammad set a different example for him and tried to have him channel that energy into actions that would benefit the community. Now, what about Sayyidina Aisha? Aisha, Umm al-Mu'mineen, had for years wrestled with, with jealousy, honestly, and we'll talk about that in our next lecture. Wanting to be recognized as special to the blessed Prophet wasallam. Yet at this time, when it comes to the establishment of the Diwan, she insists on equality with her sisters. Aisha was very young when she was married. How young? Well, there are debates about that. But what we know is that before she was engaged to the Prophet Muhammad Sassam, she was already engaged to someone else. And this was the culture and custom of that, that time. Both men and women got married very, very young. Now, uh, the man to whom Aisha was engaged uh, his parents agreed to release her from the engagement because they were not Muslim and they didn't want their son to become Muslim. By marrying the Prophet Muhammad says, um, Aisha was um, liberated from that commitment uh, to a disbelieving man. And what would her life have been like with a Jahili man? Of course, the marriage was not consummated until a number of years after the engagement. Marriage is not permitted in Islam until a person, a boy or a girl, is physically able to engage in intimacy. So they're a young man or a young woman. Certainly, there was a significant age gap between Aisha and the Blessed Prophet, as there had been between the Prophet and Sayyidina Khadija, but in the opposite direction. So yes, Aisha was much younger than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the Prophet Sallam, was much younger than Sayyidina Khadija. The Prophet did not marry Aisha because she was young and just as he did not marry Khadija because she was older. He married each one because they were suitable. And age did not matter in that social context as it does in our modern social context for reasons we can discuss more another time later. But what is a suitable marriage really does depend on time and place and culture. You know, whether you're going to be living alone in a, you know, one house or apartment for a long life, God willing, with one person, no family around, or you're living in a time when death comes early and often to many and you're surrounded by uh, family and tribe and relatives. So marriage means a very different thing. So we also have to be careful not to use these as, as uh, uh, models or examples for us in their specificity, but certainly it, they are models for us in terms of the dignity, love, compassion, and agency that we see um, in these relationships. So with Aisha, as we'll discuss more next week, the Blessed Prophet وسلم, did not use his greater maturity or even his prophetic status to force her into some kind of silent or silenced obedient handmaiden, but he gave her space and support to allow her to grow into an amazing um, person. You know, she had these God-given intellectual and spiritual capacities that just flourished under the blessed, uh, in, you know, in Islam and in her relationship with the blessed prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she lived for a very long time after his death. And she used those intellectual and spiritual capacities and what she learned to the best of her ability to serve the Muslim community and become one of the founding jurists of the Muslim ummah. Now, 
another question, you know, why did the Ummul Hat and Mu'min get so much in the Diwan? And that is a really important question for us to consider. First of all, as I said, they are Ahlul Bayt. Um, unfortunately, a lot of Muslims today seem to believe that Ahlul Bayt are only those who uh, descended from the Prophet Muhammad, some his blood relatives. And there's a question, you know, how long does the Ahlul Bayt line continue? There are different opinions on that. But Ahl al-Bayt, according to uh, Surat al-Ahzab, includes the Umm al-Hatim al-Mu'minin. So the Ahl al-Bayt are the family of the Prophet Muhammad Sam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surat al-Ahzab, verse 32 says, Ya Nisa al-Nabi, O women of the Prophet, lastunna ka ahadin min nisa You are not like other women. And this really sets the standard for our understanding. The Umm al-Hat al-Mu'mineen are ontologically different from other women. What do I mean by ontologically? I mean in their being, they are not like other women. If they do something good, they get tri twice the reward. If they do something bad, they get twice the punishment. And they only get that because they at one point we're given the choice to accept that greater moral responsibility, that greater tech leaf. And we'll talk about that in, in another lecture. But for now, it's really important to understand that while they are exemplars, they're exemplars who also have a special status. There are unique and special rules for them that are not for others. And that made them really at the center of the ummah. Um, and that is also why Sayyidina Omar uh, put them at the highest level in the Diwan. They were not only the center because they were, they were uh, part of Ahl Bayt, part of the family of the Prophet Muhammad but they were literally at its center. They lived in apartments attached to the mosque of the Prophet. So they were physically at the center at a place where anyone could find them, anyone could consult with them, anyone could seek their help. And they use that position to do just that with their wealth, with their knowledge, with their experience, with their influence, as we will discuss more later. Before I end uh, for today, I'm going to um, mention a few of the sources that I'll be citing in these talks today. Um, let me pull a few of them out. Some sources that uh, are important for, um, for this kind of research, of course, the, um, uh, the histories, uh, uh, the early history of Tariq al-Tabari, and of Baladari, but especially Imam al-Tabari's history is important. Now, it's important to understand that with Imam al-Tabari in his history, as in his tafsir, he uh, includes many narrations that are contradictory, and that is because he is, he is a comprehensive collector of narrations. So he's not, um, he does not claim that each narration he collects is equally valid or relevant and we're going to talk in future lectures about this historiographical problem you know how do we know which are accurate narrations when it comes to the companions and their lives um, and how do we know which are ten tendacious or politicized or sectarian it's a big challenge um, but we, so we should be cautious when we use these, uh, the, the history of Imam al-Tabari to understand that, that uh, a lot of work has to be done to um, sift through these narrations and collect them. Um, there's another history that I, I find uh, really critical and important for, um, uh, for the Khulafa al-Rashidun, which I, which I like very much. Um, which is uh, Ibn Shubba's uh, Tariq Medina and Munawwara, which is a, um, a wonderful volume. Um, 
the author died in 262 of Hegeli. So this is another early history and it's really wonderful for extensive uh, narrations about Sayyidina Omar. Um, and I relied on those um, uh, quite extensively in my doctoral dissertation, which I wrote over 20 years ago um, uh, from the University of Chicago, a believing slave is better than an unbeliever. Um, status and community in early Islamic society and law. So my unpublished 1999 doctoral dissertation. Uh, of course, we have, especially for Sayyidina Aisha, we have many hadith, all the hadith collections have many of her narrations. We know she, that she was one of the most prolific um, contributors to hadith. Uh, we have the tabaqat and rajal literature. So, for example, um, uh, al-tabaqat al-kubra, Ibn Sa'ad's um, great early collection of biographical literature which has a um, separate volume, Kitab al-Nisa, on the women companions. Also, um, uh, there's a separate volume on the women companions in um, Ibn al-Athir's Ust al-Ghaba, um, the lions of the jungle forest. Um, another example of the Tabaqat al Raja literature, and there are many, many, many others as well that we rely on. And um, I'm going to be spending some time uh, in one of the lectures talking about um, uh, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha and Amir al-Mu'mineen Omar in the Muwatta of Imam Manak, may Allah be pleased with him. And there's a wonderful, wonderful um, translation, recent translation of the Muwatta um, a translation of the Royal Moroccan edition, um, edited and translated by uh, uh, Professor Muhammad Fallo, who was my um, colleague, student at, uh, we were, we were co-students at the University of Chicago doing our doctoral dissertation, and he now is a professor of Islamic law at the University of Toronto. So this is edited and translated by Muhammad Fallo and Kanal Manette. Um, uh, and is just a wonderful um, uh, uh, translation of the Muwatta. But uh, Sayyidina Aisha and Ahmad uh, are the most um, referenced Sahaba in the Muwatta. Now, um, Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, is also referenced. Um, but Abu Huraira has a, has a few more, you know, often he's citing not just hadith, but also other um, opinions that he heard from other companions. But what's interesting is if we compare, we will compare how Aisha's narrations, the source of her knowledge and what she says, which are specifically hadith about her intimate relations with the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, her intimate knowledge, um, are cited, are, are referenced, as well as her judgments are referenced by Imam Manik as um, authoritative. Sayyidina Omar is very interesting because it is his siyasa, his, his administration and policy that are cited more than um, um, narrations or hadith directly from the Prophet Muhammad Sallam. Well, it's a, it's a kind of a balance, but it's interesting to see um, what their contribution is in the establishment of the school of Medina um, specifically and to uh, the formation of the Islamic law in general. So we will be looking at that uh, inshallah together in our lectures and I look forward um, I look forward to uh, to discussing uh, those with you in the future. And I pray that, uh, that you enjoy all of these uh, Ramadan lectures and I will see you soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.